that's just a, a wee example of our academy teams. If you notice in the video, we start with the 13s and 19s to show you the difference between how our teams play at a younger stage in the academy to the oldest. So, again, we spoke about the, the style of play, right? We want to be a team that keeps the ball, controls the game. One of the biggest things it relies on is good coaches. Right? Everything starts with the coaches. Right? It's it's one of those things the players, like it or not, they'll they'll react to how you run the session. They'll react to the coaches. If the coach is screaming at the referee, the player starts screaming at the referee. If the you know the coach is always angry and screaming and shouting, the players are going to behave the same way. Right? So we're recognizing is a coach, is a role model, but everything starts with the, the coaches. Then we've got our methodology and what we try to put across, our, you know, our philosophy, the curriculum that's been built out by Cedric and the staff, and the, the games and things throughout, and then obviously you've got your quality players. You know, it's easy when you've got the, the quality and the the players, it's getting them to that level that is, you know, that's that's what we're trying to do. So just a wee example of how we would build sessions and, and things like that. So for example here, taking the, the overloads in the wide areas. So unbalance in the sides and finishing, combination. So our principle of play would be the combination in the wide areas. So the sub principle of that would be how do we create the overload and then can we see the players that are making the run in the box once we've created that we can get across it. And then we look at what's the, the technical requirements we need in those situations. So first touch, directional control, passes, crossing and volley. One of the questions I get asked a lot in terms of scouting is how can you, how do you see a player? Anyone get any ideas? What do you look for in a player? What would you look for? No, no. That's the oldest trick in the book. I've saw that one a hundred times. Oh, me? Oh, <laughs> uh, I don't know, for me, I look for a player that understands the concepts and is able to read the game. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, I look for a touch out of space, do they play the one two, do they look to combine, you know, how do they control the ball, you know, plenty of players that have got the heart of their line, but a first touch like a trampoline, right, see them all the time, but the reality, how does a player, what do they do with their first touch, how aware are they of what's going on around them, you know, especially you see the midfielders all the time, can they turn and get some space, can they play forward, very easy. I, I see players a lot that will play balls across the back line. Never, oh, he never. He always connects his passes. How many times does he break the line? How can he do it with speed and in tempo and trying to get a rhythm in the game? So from from there, everything that happens within the the setup at the academy starts with the game at the end of the week. So we always finish our weekly cycle with a game, right? That revolves around the principle of play. So what will happen is, on a Monday morning or a Monday afternoon, the coaches will come in to the stadium. Each coach will meet individually with Cedric, our academy technical director. They have to explain what the end game is, right? So whatever they're going to finish with on a Thursday night is the focus. Because from there, everything else is built around that. So as we go through the, the structure of the, the session, we're then starting to look at what is the tactical tools that the players need to be successful. Right? What do the players have to understand? What cues do they have to recognise to make the runs, to make the movements, to be in the right positions? And then, 
the technical tools, how are they going to execute what we're asking them to do? Does that make sense? Yeah, so everything starts from the game and all the components have to lead into that, that same end goal. Okay? So again, for this, the technical exercise might be just the passing in and around the, the mannequins and look, I get it, not everyone's got a full field to train on or even half a field, sometimes not even a quarter, right? <laughs> so it's just adapting, it's another word that, that we use a lot up in Chicago, adaptability. You know, being able to replicate the movements but you know, still execute the game plan, so to speak. So that might be the technical exercise. And again, positional game, maybe it's possession, we connect and then they break out the box. Okay, but then again, reinforcing what's the objective, right? The objective is always that unbalancing, combining the wide areas, right? So that has to be the overarching principle of play as we go through it, being really clear about the organisation, I can't stress that one enough, right, when it's like, oh, okay, yeah, I'll, ah, yeah, I'll get to it later, we'll figure it out, I'll eyeball it, and know, you know, the dimensions, have everything set up, the variations, how do we, how do we challenge the players, right, they go into the exercise, it's too easy, it's too difficult, there's no flow, there's no rhythm, they're not really getting out the session and um, what we want them to get, so how can we adapt it to make it that we get the point across and make sure the players take away what we require from them. And then obviously the points, are we watching, are, are they doing it? And then what's the, what's the success? How do we measure success? Yeah. So the big thing in the training Training sessions, you know, we want the players to make decisions for themselves. There's too many sessions where you see play from A to B to C to D to E, and there's no thought, right? For technical repetition, yes, but to create smart players, there needs to be some sort of decision making process in there, okay? Always try to pose the questions to the players, right? Try to do it through the, um, the guided discovery methods. You guys have all been through the stuff with Piaget and the guided discovery stuff. So, you know, using those kind of methods, you know, always asking the question, what else could have been done? You know, what would be the next movements of the ball? Where's the next two or three passes going? And what happens if we lose the ball? What's our transition? What's our exit route? How do we get the ball back? Okay, and always, a lot of the time, when something goes wrong, we're quick to go stop, right? This isn't working, bang, 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 right? Sometimes stop to show the positive, right? We always tend to focus on the negative, but it's really important as well to the players to get across the positive points, the things are doing well, and reinforce that. So... The other thing, just demanded in sessions, you know, our coaches um, in the academy, you know, some of them, they'll really get on the guys, they'll really push them, you know, when, try to get them out of that comfort zone, that's, that's the key. You know, competition, as soon as possible, make sure they're competitive, make sure, I mean, nowadays, I see a lot of kids that, they come off a field and it's just, it's all right, we'll win next week, don't worry about it. You know, that's, you know, we want to build that winning mentality in the players, that they want to win, they want to be successful. It's, it's one of those things, you know, do they have that hunger inside them? You know, that, that hunger to say, you know what, I'm going to do something, I'm going somewhere, I'm going to achieve the goals, not just that the club have set me, but the goals I've set myself. Okay, uh, obviously that's individual, collective, it could be the 5v5, five five, they're picking up all the equipment and whatever else, and obviously consequences for the, the losers, so 
That's something we're pretty high on back in Chicago. And it's amazing just the difference you see in their attitudes when they think they're going to have to actually do something. Uh, coaching still at the game, the team talk, you know, balancing it between your tactical information, the motivation for the game, you know, and just being positive, getting them, them ready. Um, during the game, not overcoaching, not you pass there, you pass there. Why did you play that ball? Because you played it to him three times and he's not won it. Or, right? Sometimes it's about seeing, predicting the situations and trying to be involved in the, the phases of play without joysticking the players almost. Um, talk to them when you need to. You know, if it's the same mistake, three, four, five times he's tried to play the ball down the line, the players come across and intercepted, it's not working. So how do maybe we need to go and say, well listen, that ball doesn't work. What else can we do in that situation? And get the players to think how can they solve the problems. You know what? Yeah. How do you how does a coach can you recognise whether you're joysticking the players continuously? How can a it's coach tough. It's how do you recognise that in your mind? I think it's, it's a lot of self reflection. A lot of self reflection, I think being able to recognize your actions through the game. You know, it doesn't always happen in the game, but maybe later on, you know, keeping notes, keeping a log of, well, this went well, I thought this worked, this worked, this didn't. Been. Sometimes you need someone there to point it out to you, to say, listen, you've been a wee bit you know, you're trying to control it too much, just someone to just settle you down a bit, you know. And I think that goes from youth level right the way through to the professional game. Because there's plenty of guys in the, the professional game that will be, you'll see them screaming, the arms will be going, they'll be shouting at every player that runs by them in their side of the field. And um, I think, yeah, the two things I would say is just the self-reflection and trying to be aware of the points you've made. And also thinking, one of the things I used to always do is, in any game, I would write down some notes of, if I had to do it again, if I had to play that game again, what would I do differently? You know, so it would always be like, you write one game plan for the game, and then you write a second one to do the game after the game, if that makes sense at all. You know, so you're writing to you're just more reflective on, on that. But as I say, it always helps if you can have an assistant or someone else with you on the bench so that it's not just in your mind, right? In my mind, I'm great. I should be at Barcelona, right? <laughs> the reality, <laughs> I know that. I about this today, actually, so it's very true. Yeah, right. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I know that someone's going to go, well, wait a minute, take a step back. Just settle down, you know, so I, I think that's always, always important. I think maintaining <laughs> composure and staying calm, right? I don't believe, if a coach can't control himself, I don't believe they can control a team. And that is from grassroots to the pros. Any coach that can do that part is, is in big trouble. And then fair play, you know? We want to win, maybe not at all costs, but we want to win, right? The winning is is a big factor of, you know, it's, the game is the objective. The objective of the game is to score more goals than the other team, <laughs> you know? Um, half time, question the players, what did they see? Because sometimes we're standing on the sideline and we're seeing something happen, the players are in the game, they see something totally different. Now, it might be right, or it might be, well, I never really saw that actually, but sometimes there's a balance. Sometimes they can be right and they'll bring up a point that you haven't seen, you know, because you're focusing on, it's easy to get caught up on what's happening over here off the ball. Like one of the biggest criticisms I've got of youth soccer is the player with the ball and the three players around them are all active. 
You look at the guy on the far side of the field, they're normally standing something like this. You know, just staring at the sky watching the pigeons or something, right? They've all got to be involved. They've got to be looking for ways to get themselves involved in the game. So, for example, if the ball's coming in and the central midfielder gets it, is that guy on the opposite side starting to make his run? Is he recognising that within two passes that ball could beat his feet in probably less than five seconds? You know? So, recognising those things. Never be afraid to, to change things. Right? There was one bit of advice that was given to me um, by a coach in England. And I asked him the question, I said, what do you do when it doesn't go to your plan? You know, what happens? You're 10 minutes into a game, you're 2-0 down. And he goes, the last thing you do is throw away the game plan. He goes, 1-2-0, depending on how you've conceded the goals. And it's that word, depending on. <laughs> well, those words are very important. If it's just been like something silly, that they've just got the opportunist moment to score, then... Okay, just keep to the game plan, but don't be afraid to make the adjustments if you have to change things.